Thank you for the introduction. Uh, so in this talk, about, uh, I'll talk about some recent progress in the, uh, in the problem Hamiltonian learning. And if there is time, I'll also mention some open problems. Uh, so this talk is mainly based on uh, the following two works. Uh, the first one is a collaboration with uh, Robert Huang from Caltech, Di Fang from Duke, uh, Yuan Su from Microsoft. And the second work is a collaboration with uh, Hao Ya Li and uh, Hong Kang Ni, who are, who are both from Stanford University. Uh, Tuya, who's from Caltech, and Lexing, who's from Stanford. Actually, most of the others are here, so if I fail to answer your question, you can ask them. Um, right. Uh, so I will focus on learning the Hamiltonian from time evolution in this talk, uh, with a focus on uh, Heisenberg limit and the role of quantum control. Uh, what I will not talk about is learning Hamiltonian from Gibbs state or ground state, which is kind of a separate topic, and I point you to Difference, these references if you are interested. So uh, the problem set up is as follows. We have a n qubit quantum system evolving under Hamiltonian H. Uh, we are allowed to interact with this quantum system, and the goal is to have a complete characterization of the Hamiltonian H classically. And in order to make it efficient, we also assume some prior knowledge of H. Uh, so more concretely, by interaction, I mean that we can prepare an initial state, uh, which is this state phi, uh, apply, uh, so run time evolution, and apply unitaries during time evolution. So this u1, u2, all the way to ur are unitaries that we can choose what they are. But this time evolution, e to the minus iht, is, is like a given to us through the system. But we can control how long we want, to, want it to evolve. And in the end, we perform some measurement to extract classical information. Uh, and we may add some further uh, restriction, such as the initial states, unitaries, and the measurements should all be simple in some way. For example, we, uh, we like force them to be only like a single qubit operations, which is kind of the cheapest thing you can do on, on your quantum device. Uh, and by characterization, I mean that H is a uh, it's written as a linear combination of poly matrices, uh, uh, poly operators, and uh, the goal is to learn all the coefficients associated with each poly operator. Uh, so there are exponentially many of them, uh, which, is, which precludes any possibility of learning all of them if we know nothing at the very beginning. So we need to introduce some prior knowledge. So the prior knowledge we have is that that only a known subset of those coefficients are non-zero, uh, and uh, this subset is poly n size. So this means there is some hope of getting a, uh, getting a poly n cost. And the, all the coefficients has their magnitude upper bounded by one. Uh, so this kind of assumption arises naturally when your quantum system is subject to some physical constraint, such, that, so, like, such as it was, uh, when it's geometrically local. Uh, and compared to the quantum computing setting, uh, we have the further restriction, which is we cannot apply control to time evolution or inverse time evolution. So in, in quantum computing setup, we usually just don't distinguish between the cost of, of these things from the cost of applying e to the minus iht. But here, because we're thinking of having an experimental system that's evolving on its own, like these, these things are totally different, so we don't assume access to these articles. Uh, and uh, we need some way to, uh, yes, please. Sorry, when you say geometrically local, do you mean we have an assumption on the geometry of our system? Is it like integrated? Yeah, yeah. So usually you have some underlying geometry of your system, and your, your Hamiltonian terms only act on term, uh, qubits that are like oh, close to each other. Does that change how we interact with the ball, or is it just like in, in this case? Yeah, yeah, yeah. so it, it definitely changes how you interact with the system. Like, uh, it depends on your geometry. Yeah. Uh, so other questions? Uh, and we need some way to measure the cost of uh, solving this problem. Uh, so let me first uh, tell you a, a not so good way of solving this problem, which is we can simply learn this time evolution operator, this whole unitary for some small tau using, uh, using, using the, uh, this recent work by uh, Bahai, Kotari, uh, O'Donnell, and Town, which uh, helps you characterize the entire unitary. From that, you can definitely extract the information about the Hamiltonian as well. 
Uh, but to do that, you will need a query complexity that is exponential in N. But the scaling with the precision parameter is actually extremely good, uh, epsilon inverse. So I will actually come back to this point later. Uh, but we, but this in, involves like exponentially many queries, which we don't want. So we want the cost to be at most a polynomial in N, right? And uh, before we talk about cost, we need to define first. Uh, so a natural way to define is to consider a query complexity. But I would argue this is not a very good metric to use here, because uh, like you can imagine, on one hand you can evolve for a time that is like 0 0.01. On the other hand, you can evolve for a time that is 1,000. And this second scenario is definitely more expensive than the first. So we need some, some like cost to capture that. So what we do is to look at the total evolution time, uh, which means if we evolve for time T1, T2, all the way to Tn experiment, then the total evolution time is all the individual times added together. Uh, and uh, so this captures, like if you run for very long time in a single experiment, that, that goes into part of the cost. Uh, and uh, uh, so n experiment is the number of experiments we run. So while we, we mainly focus on total evolution time, we also need to keep, make sure the number of experiments don't blow up. And also we need to make sure the number of unitaries we apply is not too large. So this problem is closely connected to, the, uh, to quantum metrology, which is usually about high precision estimation of a few physical parameters. Uh, and people usually care about asymptotic convergence given good prior information. So usually we start from some good initial guess and then uh, use some measurement result to update this, this uh, initial guess in order to uh, asymptotically, like gradually converge to the exact value. And the convergence rate is governed by the quantum Fisher information. Uh, so this is what, usually, what is usually done in quantum, quantum metrology. Uh, and it is useful for many things, such as detecting a uh, gravitational wave. Here I have a picture from LIGO. Uh, so, but in Hamiltonian learning, we care about something a little different, which is uh, we care about estimating many parameters. Uh, and, uh, and we also care about a non-asymptotic protocol which means we don't start with good initial guess. Rather, we start with only very vague information, such as all the coefficients are between plus one and minus one. So uh, this is the difference. But I think like this is not a hard line dividing these two. Rather, you have a you will you, you can imagine some scenarios in between. Uh, so for brief history on this topic, uh, so the earliest work that I'm aware of on this topic were done in 2012. Uh, by this group of people. So they proposed a heuristic algorithm to solve this problem based on optimization and the Bayesian inference. Uh, some of the proposals were actually experimentally implemented, such as uh, there's an experimental work implementing it on, on a single spin in NV center. Uh, people have also studied like doing Hamiltonian for learning for non-intacting bosons on uh, superconducting qubits. Uh, and the more rigorous study of this topic uh, began in very recently, like in this 2021 work by Ha, Kodari, and Tan, they, uh, they proposed uh, the, the first algorithm with rigorous guarantee that I know of to solve this problem. So, uh, so for concrete setup, we want to learn all the linear n number parameters in the Hamiltonian, each of them to precision epsilon with probably at least a one minus delta. Uh, so in this 2021 work, uh, the authors propose an algorithm that uh, can solve this problem with epsilon to the minus two log n over delta total evolution time. Uh, so their algorithm was mainly proposed for learning Hamiltonian from Gibbs state, but you can uh, easily extend it to learn, uh, learn Hamiltonian from real time evolution as well. And their result was uh, improved in various ways in the following, uh, in these two works in, in 20, uh, 22. And also, uh, there's this work uh, listed down here that can perform Hamiltonian learning uh, with, with, uh, with spam robustness. So by spam, I mean, uh, so spam stands for a state preparation and a measurement. Uh, so usually when you perform an experiment, your, your state preparation and measurement will each involve some error uh, that can be characterized by a quantum channel. Uh, and it is often the case that this error is the dominant source of error. 
So by spam robust, I mean that when this error is below some constant threshold, you will be able to learn the Hamiltonian uh, parameters to arbitrarily high precision. So this is an extremely good property to have, uh, and uh, their algorithm did that in 2022 by essentially turning the Hamiltonian learning problem into a polychannel estimation problem. However, this comes at a cost, which is the epsilon dependence uh, went from epsilon to the minus two to epsilon to the minus four. Uh, and all these approaches, I would call them the perturbative approach uh, for a reason that I will uh, describe later. So I have a question. Yes. Uh, can you remind us what the scaling on the temperature of these approaches is? Are you looking at high temperature of thing and then the deviation from that? Or? Uh, temperature. Uh, yeah, so, so far I'm talking about learning Hamiltonian from real-time evolution. Uh, right, so there isn't a temperature uh, to... In these uh, works. In, in these works? Well, I mean, so, so you were uh, talking about these works, which are about learning Hamiltonians from having access oh, to Gibbs states. Uh, Gibbs state, okay, so I see. the complexity that depends on the temperature. You yeah, know? yeah, sure. Uh, yeah, so if I understand correctly, uh, like, you can only work with high temperature, like beta being close to zero. Okay. Uh, and there is an exponential cost in terms of beta if you want to go to low temperature. So when you say that you can connect this problem to it, uh, those results, you are thinking like small time evolutions. Yes, yes, so exactly. So uh, that's what not, not I did, but what they did in this paper, which is considering, okay. uh, yeah, like only short time evolution, which is kind of closely connected to uh, high temperature deep state. Okay. Uh, any other question? So, uh, yeah, and in 2022, my co-authors and myself proposed this algorithm that so solves this Hamiltonian learning problem with the following cost. Uh, so it, is, it goes like epsilon inverse times log n over delta. And this epsilon inverse, we call it a Heisenberg scaling because uh, it saturates the fundamental limits as dictated by quantum mechanics. But this is best possible scaling you can you can get. And moreover, this uh, algorithm is spam robust. So basically, we get all the, combine all the good features from previous algorithms. Uh, so in this, in this protocol, we will need to use uh, insert random poly operators during time evolution, uh, which means we need some kind of quantum control uh, in the algorithm. Uh, and uh, people later study, like, is it, is it necessary to use quantum control? Can we just let the system evolve and do nothing do in the middle? Uh, and turns out the answer is no. Uh, like you have to have some kind of quantum control in order to reach a Heisenberg limit, which was proved uh, in this uh, recent work by this group of others. Uh, and uh, so so far we've been focusing on uh, the qubit setting, but you can actually extend the uh, this protocol to the bosonic setting as well, uh, where instead of applying random poly operators, we apply random Gaussian unitaries uh, and uh, you will get the same uh, total evolution time scaling, but this time it works for both sounds. Uh, right, then I will first explain the perturbative perturb approach, and then I will show you why the perturbative approach cannot take you to the Heisenberg limit. Uh, so to remind you, the Hamiltonian we study looks like this. It's a linear combination of poly operators. We want to learn all these coefficients. And uh, the key observation in the perturbative approach is that the time evolution operator for small time t is almost linear in H, uh, as observed by SOMA, like we deal with t that is small. Uh, so uh, in each experiment, we can start from a state rho, evolve for time t, and then measure observable O. Uh, the, the, the expectation value will look like this, so trace rho uh, uh, times this time evolved operator. Uh, and then we take derivative. Uh, at time zero. So what we get is this trace row and commutator between H and O. So we can uh, permute these things cyclically to get this form. Uh, so this is actually very useful if we want to extract a coefficient from the Hamiltonian because we can simply choose rho and O such that uh, the commutator between these two is proportional to the uh, poly operator whose coefficient we want to estimate. Uh, so we can just plug this thing into here, uh, and because all the poly operators are like orthogonal to each other in this uh, in this Hilbert speed inter product, uh, what we get is that the derivative is 
uh, exactly the coefficients multiplied to minus two. So as long as we can estimate the derivative, we will be able to estimate the parameters. Right? So, uh, so in this work, in this work by uh, Steel Franca and co others, they uh, they show that derivatives can be estimated accurately using polynomial interpolation, and you can estimate many derivatives simultaneously uh, using classical shadows. Um, so now this is basically what the perturbative approach does. Uh, so now let's estimate the cost. So we need to estimate quantities uh, that are of this form, which you do by sampling and taking average. Uh, and the, the error will decay like 1 over square root of ns, where ns is the number of samples. So this is the uh, same scaling you just saw in Robin's talk. Uh, and uh, we will, need, we will need to estimate these things to epsilon precision in order to estimate parameters to epsilon precision. So that means uh, the number of samples will scale like epsilon to the minus two. Your total evolution time will be linear in the number of samples. So that means the total evolution time scales like epsilon to the minus two. So this is the standard quantum limit, which is the best thing you can do when you estimate parameter from a quantum state. But here we are estimating things from a dynamical process so actually there is some room to gain a further advantage. Uh, where, so in this scenario, the fundamental limit is called the Heisenberg limit, where we can hope to get t equal to epsilon inverse. And the example complex can be made very low. It's actually log epsilon inverse. Uh, yes? I just would like to ask, what is rho uh, in the perturbative approach? What, what is the state that you... Right, so you're, you're asking in, in, this, in this perturbative approach how to choose rho. Uh, so rho is just a poly eigenstate. Yeah, it's a uh, so you choose rho and a, uh, and observable so that the commutator gives you the correct poly operator. Yeah, and uh, yeah, rho is just i plus some poly divided by two to the n. So that's easy to prepare. Um, other question? Right. So. So, so that is the cost, like uh, epsilon to the minus two, if you take the perturbative approach. Uh, well, this is what we hope for, like uh, epsilon inverse. Uh, and the perturbative approach can never give you the Heisenberg limit. Uh, this is because of the following argument. So it, let's just take t to be some constant. Uh, and, uh, and we can compute the, the Fisher information coming from each experiment, which will also be some constant. Uh, and we need the Fisher information of all experiments combined together to be epsilon to the minus two, as required by the kramer Uh This tells us that we need at least epsilon to the minus two many experiments to get to epsilon standard deviation. Uh, so this is this single arg simple argument works for uh, non-adaptive estimation, uh, if and when we want to get an unbiased estimate for the for the parameters. So uh, we may also consider. Uh, adaptive experiments, and we may also allow a, a biased estimation, uh, but this proof can actually be extended to cover those cases as well. So you will never be able to uh, reach, reach the Heisenberg limit with only t equal to 01. Actually, this is the best thing you can achieve if, you only, uh, if you're only allowed to evolve for a short amount of time. Uh, and this tells us that reaching the Heisenberg limit requires something uh, qualitatively different. You cannot just uh, fine tune this method to, to get a better scaling. Uh, so now I will give you an example of how to reach the Heisenberg limit, which is the simplest example I can find. So if you have attended a tutorial session, you may have already seen this example, but I think it's, it would be good to go over it again since you have most likely forgotten about it already. Uh, so let's consider a time dependent signal S of t, which is uh, rotating with some frequency theta plus some Gaussian noise. Uh, uh, and actually the noise doesn't have to be Gaussian, just write it to be Gaussian here for simplicity. And we know that theta is between some uh, uh, minus one and one, and we want to estimate it to precision epsilon. Uh, so one way to do that is we just fix t to be something. Uh, pi, it's, it's not important what, what it is here, but it's some constant. We average out the noise so that uh, g is gone and estimate theta uh, by just taking the log, right? So that's, that's the most direct way to do it. Uh, and uh, 
That will require epsilon to the minus two examples simply because we need to estimate this thing to precision epsilon and we need to average out, out the noise so that its effect is less than epsilon, right? Uh, and uh, so this is the most uh, direct approach, which is not what we want to do because it doesn't give us the correct scaling. Uh, and I will outline a method that uses log epsilon inverse many examples and epsilon inverse total evolution time. Uh, so this essentially follows the idea of this 2015 paper uh, by this group of authors uh, who proposed a, a robust phase estimation protocol to do gate calibration. Um, so uh, to remind you, by total evolution time, I mean that suppose our examples are st1, st2, stn, s, then the total evolution time is t1 plus t2 plus all the way to tn, s, which is the amount of time needed to generate all these samples added together. Right. Uh, so or we can actually reduce this problem to a decision problem, uh, and the, the process is probably very similar to what uh, Robin mentioned in his talk but didn't elaborate. Here I will elaborate it. Uh, so, uh, so this decision problem is as follows. Suppose we know that uh, there is the theta, which is the parameter we want to estimate, is between A and B, uh, which is somewhere in here. We want to determine its theta in the left two-third part or in the right two-third part. Uh, so if we can solve this decision problem, then we can update A and B. Because like, theta, initially we know theta is here. If we know it's actually here, then we just keep A the same, but update B to be this value. Right? And uh, similarly, if we know theta falls somewhere in here, then we update A, but keep B the same. Uh, this yes? This is a type of point of right? Yeah, uh, this so is. Why, why not? Choose the middle. Yeah, yeah, why not choose the little, uh, middle? That's a, that's a really good question you will see in the next slide. <laughs> uh, yeah. So, uh, yeah, so we can update A and B. Uh, each time we do that, uh, the distance between A and B will be reduced by one third, which means the uncertainty will be reduced by one third. Uh, and uh, we keep doing it, A and B will converge to theta from both sides, and it takes only log epsilon inverse many uh, steps to converge to get to epsilon precision that we want. So this is essentially binary search. Why don't we just do binary search? This actually, uh, yeah, this is actually because the way we solve this decision problem. So we solve the decision problem by looking at the value of this function, which is a shifted and rescaled sine function. Uh, so you don't need to worry about why it looks like this. The only thing you need to know is that it can be evaluated from the, uh, from the signal as t star for t star that is equal to pi over b minus a. So you can see if a and b gets closer and closer to each other, t star will also get larger, which means it becomes more expensive to get an example. So the, the function looks like this. Uh, so it's actually monotonously increasing from a to b. Uh, and uh, if the function value is upper bounded by one half, then we know theta must be somewhere in, in here. Uh, and if the function value is lower bounded by minus one half, we know theta must be uh, in the right two third, like some, somewhere in here. So everything can be done by evaluating the function value. Uh, and actually evaluating it only to very low precision is enough. We only need to evaluate this function to precision one half. And that is already enough for correctly determining where theta is. Uh, so this has a lot to do with why we don't do a binary search. Suppose we are doing a binary search. We need to cut it in the middle, right? And uh, suppose we are cutting it in the middle. Theta is somewhere to the right of the middle line, but there is a small error in our estimation that will immediately take it to the left of the middle line, which means we will be getting to a, getting an incorrect result. But here, how do we get an incorrect result? Uh, so if theta is somewhere in the middle third, you will never be able to get an incorrect result because whatever outcome you choose is always correct. In order to get an incorrect result, you need theta to be somewhere in here, and your error needs to take it all the way to here. Right? So that requires error that's on the order of one, and if you have one half precision, you can already guarantee this will never happen. So that's the point of like, dividing it into uh, three parts rather than two parts. Uh, and uh, we need to hold procedure to succeed with very uh, high confidence level. So to get to a confidence level one minus delta prime, we need log delta prime inverse many examples uh, just by doing a majority voting. 
Uh, so that's how we solve the decision problem. You have already seen that solving the decision problem can help us estimate the data. Uh, now we propose a way to solve the decision problem. So that's basically the algorithm. You have the whole algorithm. Uh, so now let's estimate the cost. Uh, so at the last search step, the distance between A and B will be on the order epsilon. Therefore, we need to choose this T star to be on the order epsilon inwards. Uh, and uh, the cost of last step is therefore like roughly just linear in this T star, which is epsilon inverse. Uh, now we can compute the cost of all steps. So this is the cost of the last step. Uh, the cost of the previous step is actually two-thirds of that. And you multiply a further two-thirds uh, from, from the, uh, the, the third to last step and, and so on. So basically, you, you add up a geometric sequence that add up to a constant. Uh, so in the end, your, your cost is just epsilon inverse times the log factor, uh, which gives us the Heisenberg scaling that we want. Uh, and uh, yeah, we need each step to succeed with very high probability. So this delta prime needs to scale it down accordingly. Uh, and the total evolution time will be epsilon inverse time a log factor. Uh, and because we are only taking log epsilon inverse many steps, that is the number of examples we need. And the procedure is robust to noise. So as long as your, uh, your bias plus standard deviation is upper bounded by some constant, you will be able to get, uh, get data up to arbitrarily high precision. Uh, so, so this is a very nice feature to have. Uh, so why is that relevant to Hamiltonian learning? Uh, now we can think of estimating uh, the simplest possible Hamiltonian. So H equal to theta Z, where Z is the poly Z matrix. Uh, we want to estimate what, the, what this theta is. So what we do is we start from the plus state, evolve for time T, measuring the x basis. You can look at the expectation value. It's cosine to theta t. Similarly, we can measure in the y basis. Uh, do, do the same experiment, but measuring the y basis, the expectation value is going to be minus 2 sine uh, uh, 2 theta t. Uh, so, uh, so we just add these two things together to get a signal that is like rotating with frequency 2 theta plus some sampling noise, uh, which is exactly what we had from the previous previous experiment, right? And then we just apply that robust phase estimation procedure to get theta. So that allows us to uh, estimate theta with Heisenberg limit scaling for this simple Hamiltonian. Uh, so, so, okay, you have already seen an example of Hamiltonian learning with Heisenberg limit scaling. Can we just, uh, can we just do it for many body Hamiltonian, like a, Hamiltonian involving many qubits. So that's the next, next question uh, we're going to look at. Uh, so, so far we have seen that re reaching the Heisenberg limit requires long time evolution. So if you only you go for constant time, you will never be able to get there by this, uh, by this Fisher information argument. Uh, and, uh, uh, but if you evolve for a long time in a many body system, as what we did in the, uh, in the single qubit example, you will run into a new problem, which is many body systems thermalize during time evolution. Uh, what this means is that if you look at local observable O, look at its expectation value as some late time T, then it will roughly be equal to the thermal expectation value, which doesn't change with time. Uh, so that means uh, expectation values stop changing, evolving for longer does not yield more information because you just keep getting the same result. Right. Uh, and uh, uh, so this is for local observable. So what, what about if you use non-local observable doing tangle measurement? Uh, it actually doesn't help either, because, uh, as proved in this recent work. Uh, so they use a stronger assumption, which is eigenstate thermalization hypothesis. So they show that if you want to learn many parameters simultaneously, uh, then even and and with Heisenberg limit scaling, then even even non-local uh, observables will not help you. Uh, so here, this is difficulty. Like we need long time evolution, but when we run long time evolution, it thermalizes, which uh, prevents us from extracting any useful information. Uh, so now we want to get get around this uh, difficulty. So what is the opposite of thermalization? So the so what what we know is that when there is an abundance of local conservation laws, uh, thermalization can in some way be prevented. So examples include uh, integrable models, 
which don't thermalize at all, uh, or like systems that thermalize very, very slowly, such as many body localized systems. In both cases, we have an abundance of low cost conservation laws that uh, kind of prevent thermalization. So if we can artificially create uh, local conservation laws, then we may be able to use it to get a coherent signal at late times. So that's the main idea. Uh, and we create local conservation laws by inserting random poly operators. Uh, so what we do exactly is like this. Uh, this is a time, of, time evolution operator we start with. We cut it into uh, like short time segments, each of lengths tau, and between each short time evolution, we insert random poly operators. So those P1, P2, all the way to PR are uniformly randomly drawn from a poly subgroup K. So GN here is the poly group, K is a subgroup of it. And because uh, those, those PJs are poly operators, you can move them up into the exponent to rewrite the whole expression in this way. Uh, now we look at uh, what happens in each short time step. Uh, so rho gets mapped to uh, this, uh, this commutator, rho minus this commutator uh, with, average, uh, with expectation value taken over all the p that is uniformly drawn from subgroup k up to some second order error, which we ignore for the moment. Uh, so we can move this expectation value inside the commutator. So this will give us an effective Hamiltonian that looks like the following. So it's an expectation value of OPHP, uh, and because P is uniformly drawn from this subgroup, it is actually just the average over all the uh, PHP where P is a group element. Uh, and if we look at the time evolution operator, it takes e to the minus IHT from e to the minus H effective T. So the system now evolves under effective Hamiltonian. Uh, so this is the same idea underlying the Q-drift algorithm for Hamiltonian simulation. So why do we do that? Uh, so here, the Hamiltonian is transformed in this way. So the reason we go through this procedure is that now every element in K is a conservation law in the effective Hamiltonian. So in this way, we create a large number of conservation laws. Uh, so we can easily verify this. Uh, we just draw any element Q from the subgroup K, uh, and we compute Q, H effective Q. Uh, so plugging this expression for H effective into here, we get this form. Uh, so P is uniformly randomly drawn from K. Q is an element in K. So P times Q is also uniformly randomly drawn from K, which means the expression doesn't change at all. So this is still equal to H effective. So what this tells you is that Q and H effective commute with each other, which means Q is a conserved quantity in the effective Hamiltonian. Uh, and uh, uh, so, so that's good. We create a lot of conservation laws. But one thing we need to worry about is that does it also kill off the information we want? Uh, the answer is no. The coefficients we want to learn are actually preserved in the process. Uh, so for any poly operator P prime that is in the poly group, we look at how it gets transformed through, through this procedure. So we average over all the P, P prime P, and there are actually only two possible outcomes. So either P prime is in the centralizer of the subgroup K. In that case, P and P prime will always commute with each other, and then you will get just P prime back uh, in this process. Uh, in the second scenario, uh, P, uh, this P prime will not be in the centralizer, then it will exactly uh, commute with half of the element in K and anti-commute with the other half. So this comes from special property of the polygroup, and you will get this term canceled exactly. So what you get in the end is a H effective that is now the summation over all the P that is in the centralizer of K uh, and with the same coefficient as before. So the coefficients are preserved. Uh, yes, Did you tell us already what is what you're going to choose as K or not yet? Uh, yeah, so I will give some examples, but I will not tell you exactly how we choose K for a complicated Hamilton. Uh, okay. uh, yeah, we, we can talk about the detail later if you're interested. Okay, uh, it's, it's complicated or? Uh, sorry? It's complicated? Yeah, it's, yeah, it's complicated. Uh, yeah. So wouldn't this also serve for this effective H if you have some? Uh, but, but your H effective has a large number of conservation laws, right? So it's, it's, 
effectively an integral model. So it's basically an integral model. So it, like some noise, but still for this, you have yeah, of course, of course. If you have the environmental noise, it will still thermalize. But if you have the environmental noise, you need to do more work to, to get in the Heisenberg limit other than just this. Here, I'm not assuming any environmental noise. When you say thermalize, the previous is closed system. Uh, sorry? When you say thermalization, you mean closed system. Yeah, yeah, so it's a subsystem thermalization. Uh, uh, any other question? Right. Uh, okay, so now, uh, and now you see, like, uh, we, we get these two things. We get a lot of conservation loss, but, but the coefficients we want to learn are still preserved in the process. Uh, and uh, I will give you a, a concrete example of how we, how we do it, like how, basically how to choose this k for a simple example. Uh, for example, we have, a, uh, we have a 1D system where each qubit interacts with only its neighbors. And then we can choose k to be generated by uh, z3, z6, z9, x3, x6, x9, basically all the mo integer multiples of 3. Uh, so if you do that, uh, then p will be in the centralizer only when it acts trivially on qubits 3, 6, 9, and so on. Uh, so that means uh, if H has only nearest neighbor interaction, then the system will be decoupled. Uh, let's just consider, say, we have a x, x term acting on these two qubits. It will fail to commute with these uh, z3, so that this, this term will be killed when you, when you apply those random poly operators. Uh, so, so what this effectively means is that the qubits 3, 6, 9, and so on are suppressed. So that now you have qubits 1 and 2 interacting with each other, but not with the rest of the system. Qubits uh, 4 and 5 interacting with each other, but not with the rest of the system. So effectively, it just reduce the uh, big Hamiltonian learning problem into a bunch of very small problems. Um, uh, and uh, we can also use this subgroup approach to uh, make the effective Hamiltonian diagonal in a certain basis. For example, if we choose k to be gener generated by x1, x2, x3, and so on, then the Hamiltonian H will be, uh, will be diagonal in the X spaces. Right? So uh, we use these two things uh, to uh, decouple the system into non-interacting clusters, uh, and each cluster is evolving under a Hamiltonian that is diagonal with respect to a known basis. Uh, so that helps us uh, apply some phase estimation protocol to, to learn all the coefficients we want. Uh, and the Hamiltonian coefficients are preserved in the process, so we, we are still able to learn them from the effective Hamiltonian. Uh, so, uh, so far you have seen a 1D example, but you can actually generalize the procedure to all bounded degree local Hamiltonians. By bounded degree local Hamiltonian, I mean that each Hamiltonian term is, involves only O1, uh, constant number of qubits, and each qubit is involved in only constant number of terms. Um, right. And uh, if you're familiar with dynamical decoupling, this, uh, this procedure may look somewhat uh, connected, but I would say this is, uh, yeah, this is a more versatile procedure because you get to choose wh which subgroup you want to uh, use. Uh, any question? Yes. Can you just say like a little bit more about the, which K you're gonna use for the bounded degree? Uh, yeah, so you basically apply, a, so you have an underlying a graph describing the interaction of the system, and you do some kind of coloring so that when you apply, uh, yeah, you, you apply uh, random polys to the system, uh, the system gets decoupled into like a disconnected. So it will be like all the polys on a subset of the qubits, is that right? Yes, yes, yes. Uh, so the, the Hamiltonian that you're now learning is sort of averaged over Hamiltonian, right? Can, can you yes. say a bit more about what it looks like to learn about that and then translate that back into learning about the original? Yeah, that's a good question. So, uh, so even though I'm now learning an average Hamiltonian, the coefficients are still there. Like some of the coefficients are gone. Some of the coefficients become zero. Uh, but, so, but the other coefficients are preserved. So we learn those coefficients, and then we choose a different subgroup K so that, uh, so that a different group of coefficients are preserved, and we just go through all the coefficients this way. It takes only log n many groups to, to do it. Okay. Uh, yeah. I did say understand that. I said you kill the coefficients we don't care about at this step, and then just like iterate over it. So, yes. Okay, so, okay, yes. So, okay, so but that 
that preserves the long term, like you know, long range interactions when we average it out, right? Sorry, what do you mean by long range? So, like you know, for example, like, this is like only has like local like uh, effects, right? But uh, over time, the mm -hmm. effect could propagate to the system, right? Yes. So that, that, that's what I mean. So that's going to be oh. preserved when we average it out. Uh, yeah. So, uh, yeah. So effectively, when we uh, when we apply this kind of procedure, information will uh, basically not propagate throughout the system. Your system will become decoupled into little clusters. So, okay, yeah, yeah. So you don't like need to. How close is that going to be to the original? System? It's not the same system, right? Yeah, they, they are going to be very far. Uh, it's going to be very far away from the original system simply because you're evolving with a different Hamiltonian. But but still, the, the coefficients are there, so oh. you can still learn. Yeah. Uh, yes. Um, could you explain like the complexity of? of this method, and maybe also how it depends on the particular group? Yeah, so the complexity will just be epsilon inverse times log 1 n over delta, where epsilon is the precision, and it's the system size. Delta is the confidence level. Like, 1 minus delta is the confidence level. Is that still a measure of this, like, total evolution Yeah, time? that's still total it's evolution Ignoring time. how many insertions. Uh, right, so the, the number of gates you need to insert is Epsilon to the minus two times n. So that's the number of gates you need to do. And they are single qubit gates. Right. Uh, uh, yes? So in this case, uh, the system is, uh, F, is the, the effective Hamiltonian is always in the MDL phase. It does not change into a uh, coding phase. Does uh, it change coupling parameters? Right. So it's, uh, so I don't, uh, so it's, it's actually not in a, I wouldn't say it's in a phase because this procedure is, uh, like you're actually doing something during the time evolution, right? And uh, uh, and uh, if you look at very very long time, actually, uh, yeah, actually, uh, it will not be exactly described by the effective Hamiltonian anymore. So there is some some second order error involved in the in the process. So I wouldn't say it's a phase. Yeah. Okay, well, okay, it's not phase, but uh, this will remain the robust in uh, MDL phase or uh, no MDL state or time. Yeah, so. It's, uh, so it's similar to MBL in the sense that information propagates very slowly across the system, like things are very, very localized. But I think the analogy basically stops there. Like, okay. uh, this is more like an integral system. So okay. it's even, even better than MBL, let me say. Uh, uh, yeah, other questions? Uh, oh, okay, uh, yeah, please. Sorry, yeah. last one. Um, so is it impossible when it's like a dense, uh, right, so you mean O to O in action? Yeah, sure. yeah, then you need to, then we will no longer get a log n scaling. Uh, you will still be able to get epsilon inverse, but I think the system size dependence becomes linear rather than, rather than like log. Okay. Yeah, uh, but it requires something different. Like you need to choose k in a sm smart way. Okay. Uh, this, this doesn't seem like you would ha get enough conserved quantities to, to match the degrees of freedom in the system and actually get interval. Am I misunderstanding? Are you, uh, you're saying this is enough to be fully integrable? Uh, yeah. So by, by integral, I'm talking in a rather vague sense. I think okay. I think it's enough, but uh, yeah, but we can talk about it offline. Yeah. Okay. Like uh, yes. Uh, in your example, you saying the qubit and linear river. How about the more complex situation? Something like the saying the qubit at hexagonal. Sorry, could you speak louder? Like, yeah. I want to ask about the, the example of the, the system is setting the qubit linearly. Right? Yeah, like online. Uh, right. How about the more complex situations, such, such as um, setting qubit at hexagonal rate, something like that? Yeah, yeah. Or, so uh, the, that's covered in the bounded degree local Hamiltonian case. In that case, it's bounded degree local Hamiltonian. You can consider a 2D lattice or a hexagonal lattice, basically. Uh, or a 3D system with basically any finite physical dimension that always works. Uh, yes. Uh, uh. Yeah. So just for my understanding, so in case you would not have thermalization, then you could just use uh, um, just a unitary time evolution, right? You would not need to insert these random Paulis. Is this correct? Uh, you mean we, we do it deterministically rather than random? No, no, I mean if you, I mean this is, these random Paulis are more or less required due to, to basically um, Finds a decoherence or a thermalization, and without that, you would just you could just you would not need them. Is this correct? Uh, yeah. So uh, so it indeed introduces some. Let me find it. 
uh, some decoherence uh, up to this second order. So the first order is not decoherent at all. It's just a Hamiltonian. But second order term gives you some decoherence. No, no, sorry. I mean, what, what you showed before, that if you have just a long time evolution, you, you converge to some thermal state. Uh -huh. And if you, if you just assume that this problem would be absent, if, if you didn't have this problem, then you would not need this mechanism for inserting the random Pauli's at all, right? It would be simpler. I think it was a few slides back. Uh, you mean like if the system doesn't thermalize yeah, to begin yeah. with? Uh, yeah, yeah, then, then, uh, yeah, then we cannot rule out the possibility of having a uh, procedure that, like, that can, can learn Hamiltonian without in inserting control. That situation cannot be ruled out because the proof actually relies on uh, ETH. So, uh, yeah, uh, yes. So, so if I understand correctly, you're affecting Hamiltonian only arises on average, yes? Uh -huh. Yes. Averaging over many, many configurations of single pilot system inserts. Yeah. How many of those do I need to do? Can you say something about that? Yeah, so uh, actually very few. You don't need to, uh, you, know, you don't need to average to uh, some very, say, very high precision, but rather like uh, you can tolerate a constant amount of error just because of this noise robustness I talk about in the uh, single qubit example. Yeah. Uh, Right, so, so I, I think I should wrap up. Uh, yeah, so uh, yeah, unfortunately I didn't have time to talk about other things, but uh, let's say, uh, so, the, so yeah, to summarize, we, 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 get, a, uh, we get a protocol uh, that can learn Hamiltonian with Heisberg limit scaling with this, total, this much total evolution time, uh, and the number of experiments is very good, it's only poly log, and the whole procedure uses single qubit poly eigenstates, poly gates, uh, and the single qubit measurements. So basically the simplest thing you can imagine. And uh, it is also robust against state preparation and measurement error. Uh, and uh, the whole thing can be extended to bosons, which unfortunately I don't have time to talk about. Uh, the, actually, uh, uh, Hoya and uh, Hong Kong and uh, Lexing are all here, so you can also talk to them about it. Uh, so, uh, right, so I don't have the time to talk about it. Uh, open problems are uh, yeah, feel free to chat with me about open problems if you're interested in this area. So yeah, I want to thank you for your attention.